Thank you for joining us Around the Fire. For more information or to make a donation, please visit randomactnetwork.com. Now, want to hear a scary story? This is Podolo from More Scary Stories. What good would Walter be? asked Angela. He can't help row the gondola, you know. We were talking over our planned visit to Podolo the next day. And what will he say, I asked, if he comes back from his business and finds no wife to welcome him? On the contrary, said Walter. I've often wished such a thing might happen. And so, after much discussion with this lately married, charming, devoted couple, we agreed that Podolo should be the goal for tomorrow's picnic. I felt rather silly, for everything I had said about Podolo was merely conversational exaggeration, meant to whet their curiosity, like a newspaper headline. And I knew that when Angela actually saw the dull little island, its stony and inhospitable shore littered with broken bottles and empty tins. She would think what a fool I was. So I took back everything I said, called my own bluff, as it were, and explained that I avoided Podolo only because of its location. It was four miles from Venice, and if a boisterous wind picked up, as it sometimes did without warning, we should find getting home to be difficult. Next morning in brilliant sunshine, Walter gulped down his breakfast and started for the station. I stood on the balcony watching his departure. It seemed hard that he should have to spend six hours in a stuffy train. Podolo, I must say, was looking its best. Green, flowery, almost welcoming. We cast anchor a few feet from the stony shore. Why, there's a cat, Angela suddenly exclaimed. Sure enough, there was. A little cat, hardly more than a kitten, very thin and scraggly, standing on the weedy stones at the water's edge. It was a pitiful sight. It smelled the food, she said. It's probably starving. The poor beast, added Mario, the gondolier. Its owners did not want it. It's been put here on purpose. The idea that the cat had been left to starve caused him no great concern, but shocked Angela profoundly. How abominable. We must take it something to eat at once. I thought we might wait until the meal was over. The cat would not die before our eyes, but Angela could handle no delay, and the gondola was turned to land. Meanwhile, the poor thing meowed regularly, though it had retreated and was almost invisible, a thin wisp of tabby fur against the parched stems of the outermost grasses. Angela filled her hands with chicken bones and stepped delicately onto the slippery boulders. If I can catch it, we'll take it to Venice. Left here, it'll certainly starve. I watched her approach the cat. It ran away, but only a few yards. She threw a bit of food, and it came nearer. Another, and it came nearer still. It grew less suspicious. Its tail rose in the air, and it came right up to Angela's feet. She pounced but the cat slipped through her hands like water. Again, hunger overpowered mistrust. Back it came. Once more, Angela made a grab at it. Once more, the cat eluded her. But the third time, she was successful. She got hold of its leg. It wriggled and squirmed and fought and made the angriest, wickedest sound I ever heard. Instead of growing louder as its fury mounted, the sound decreased in volume as though the creature was choked by its own rage. The spitting died off into a thin ghost of a snarl, hardly more audible than a hiss of air from a punctured tire. Poor beast, cried Mario. She ought not to treat it like that. His face gleamed with satisfaction when, intimidated by the whirling claws, she let the cat drop. It streaked away into the grass, belly to the ground. I nearly had it, I think I shall throw a coat over it next time. 
Angel climbed back into the boat and ate her asparagus in silence. I began to wish we hadn't come to Podolo. It was not the first time a picnic there had gone badly. I'll tell you what. If I can't catch it, I'll kill it. I could do it quite easily. It's only a question of dropping one of these boulders on it. Mario was horror-struck. Starvation was in the course of nature, but to deliberately kill it? It may be a messy business, but it will soon be over. Poor little thing. Such a horrible life. But we don't know that, I urged. If it could speak, it might say it preferred to live at all costs. But I couldn't move Angela from her purpose. Let's go explore the island until it's time to bathe. The cat will be over its fright by then. I promise I won't murder it except as a last resource. The word murder lingered unpleasantly in my mind. You couldn't imagine a better place for one. The water was so warm, one hardly felt the shock of going in. The only drawback was the mud, which clung to Angela's white bathing shoes. Nasty, sticky stuff. A little wind had gotten up, but the grassy rampart sheltered us. We leaned against it and smoked. Suddenly, I noticed it was past five. We ought to go soon, I said. We promised to meet Walter's train. All right, said Angela. Just let me have a go at the cat first. Let's put the food out and watch. There was no need to watch, for the cat appeared at once. Angela and I stole up behind it, but I inadvertently kicked a stone, and the cat was off like a flash. Angela looked at me reproachfully. I retreated a few yards, but the cat, no doubt scenting a trap, refused to come out. Angela threw herself on the pavement. I can see it. Give me three minutes and I'll catch it. Three minutes passed. I felt concerned for Angela, her lovely hair floating over the dark hole, her face, as much as one could see of it, a little red. The air was getting chilly. Look here, I said. I'll wait for you in the gondola. When you've caught it, give a shout, and I'll have the boat brought to land. Angela nodded. She dared not speak for fear of scaring her prey. From the gondola, I could just see the line of Angela's shoulders. Mario stood up, eagerly watching the chase. She loves it so much, he said, that she wants to kill it. We ought to start, I called across the water. Walter will be waiting at the station and wonder what has happened. Her mind was clearly on something else. Oh, he'll find his own way home. More minutes passed. One must have patience with ladies, said Mario. I tried a last appeal. What luck, Angela? Any hope of catching him? There was a pause. Then I heard her say in a curiously tense voice, I'm not trying to catch him now. We were irrevocably late to meet Walter, and the need for immediate hurry passed. Wrapped in a blanket to escape the winds, I fell asleep. Almost at once, it seemed, I began to dream. In my dream, it was night. We were hurrying across the lagoon, trying to meet Walter's train. I stopped rowing and looked around. The seat beside me was empty. Angela! I cried. But there was no answer. I grew frightened. Mario! I shouted. We have left her behind. We must go back at once. The gondolier stopped rowing and turned toward me. I could just distinguish the wild look in his face. We loved her so much, so we had to kill her. An uprush of panic woke me. I was restored to the sunshine, at least I thought so, in the ecstasy of returning consciousness. I opened my eyes to the daylight, but they didn't receive it. I wondered if I was fainting, but a glance at my watch explained everything. I had slept past eight o'clock. Mario slept on the deck. Before I had time to speak, he opened his eyes like a dog. You went to sleep, so I did too. We both laughed. Is Angela asleep, or is she still trying to catch the cat? I asked. That's where she was, but I can't see her now. We strained our eyes toward the island, much darker than the surrounding sky, and called for her. There was no answer. No sound at all but the noise of the waves. The cat wasn't big enough to hurt her, was it? Mario asked. No, no, I said. It might have scratched her, but she was trying to kill it, wasn't she? I nodded. Mario's voice was low and somber. 
In this country, we are not accustomed to kill cats. I asked him to call for her again, and he obeyed with a shout that might have raised the dead. But no answer came. Well, I said briskly, trying to conceal my agitation, we must look for her. Mario didn't answer. Walter will be getting worried. I could not understand why Mario, usually so quick to execute an order, did not move. He was staring straight in front of him. There is someone on the island, he said at last, but it's not her. Mario bent forward and touched the ground with his free hand. It was a man then, I asked. I have a pocket knife, he said, ignoring my question, but the blade is only so long. Within a couple of minutes, we had beached. Mario kept the oar in his hand. We were standing by the place where we had last seen Angela. The grass was broken and bent. She had left a handkerchief as though to mark the spot. Otherwise, there was no trace of her. He must have anchored round the other side, I said. But let's look here first. It didn't walk like a man, said Mario. We climbed the grassy rampart and began to walk round the shallow curve, stumbling over concealed brambles. From our little eminence, we could see clusters of lights twinkling across the lagoon, but no boat. We stared at each other, bewildered. Are you quite certain it wasn't Angelo you saw? I asked. How could you tell in the darkness? She was wearing a white dress, said Mario at last. This one was all in black, and it looked like a man's head. I felt a curious sensation in my spine. Mario, I said, do you think he's got anything to do with her not being here? Mario didn't answer. I don't understand why he doesn't speak to us. Mario looked at me wholly serious. Perhaps he can't speak. Anyhow, we are two against one. Come on. We soon lost sight of each other in the darkness, but I heard Mario swearing as he scratched himself on the thorny acacias. Right at the corner of the island, close to the water's edge, I found one of Angela's bathing shoes. She must have taken it off in a hurry, for the button was torn away. A little later, I made a rather grisly discovery. It was the cat, dead, with its head crushed. The pathetic little heap of fur would never suffer the pangs of hunger again. Angela had been as good as her word. I was just going to call Mario when the bushes parted and I was swept off my feet. Something hurled itself upon me, alternately dragging and carrying me until I was pitched into the gondola and felt the boat move under me. Mario, I gasped. We can't go away. The gondolier's white face stared silently. He was rowing with all his strength. The island began to recede. After a while, he sat down beside me and whispered. When I found her... She wasn't quite dead. I began to speak, but he held up his hand. She asked me to kill her before it comes back, she said. I looked behind us. Transparent darkness save for one shadow that stained the horizon black. Padolo. Mario bent his head nearer, but his voice was almost inaudible. And then she said, Speak up, I cried. It is starving too, and it won't wait. Thanks for listening.